Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. has over 30 years leading global corporations, transforming hundreds of organizations and thousands of people, including Johnson & Johnson, Estee Lauderdale, Chanel, and more. He is the founder of Valuepreneurship. Please welcome Sanjeev Lumba. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, we have an international guest, very excited about this, Sanjeev Lumba. How are we doing? Good, good, Gabriel. Great, great to be speaking to you, and 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 a big hi to your guests. Yes. Yeah. And so, where where are you calling in from? I'm I'm in London. Um, and when you said that, I had to quickly just look out of the window because uh, uh, <laughs> I lose count of where I am actually. So, no, but but today I am in London, and I live in London. Yeah, living London, and out UK. and over in London. In fact, it's eight p.m. over there right now, and and for. Mm. Uh, for just, it's actually noon here in the United States, folks. So for those listening in the United States, you can kind of get a general idea of the time chains. So Sanjeev, please introduce the audience. Who is Sanjeev? Tell us a little about yourself, a little background. Oh, wow. Um, who is Sanjeev? I think the best way to explain that is I'm an, I, I, I see myself as an instrument of value, as an instrument of, of bringing outcomes and and helping people to achieve whatever their outcomes that they're looking for so i i am a mere instrument of of value um where do i come from um so so here's the the here, here's the practical history i mean i'm indian by origin i was born in india and at the age of 10 we we moved to with my family um in, to the uk and uh and since then uh i've been Based in the UK, but you know, spent spent seven years in in France, uh, two years in America, a, um, a year in in Amsterdam. So literally, been all over all over the world with work and and so on. Um, but that's that's it. That's where I come from. Yeah. And so, would you consider yourself a, a global citizen? <laughs> You kind of seem to be everywhere. Um, I mean, who was? Hey, Gabriel, who was born? Uh, French or German or Spanish or or, or 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 Chinese or Japanese. We were actually born just as much human and DNA and the brain and the mind uh, and the heart as as anyone else. We we become these things. We 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 label these. I think I think having a cultural heritage is superbly rich and supreme because it it gives you. Uh, a most amazing dimension, which then if you share it with people from other dimensions and other cultural dimensions, just makes the richness of the world. But um, so I, I, I think at heart, I, I'll always feel Indian that that's, that's where, that's where my cultural uh, reference is. But literally, I am a citizen of, of the world. Yeah. I, I think of it like that. Yeah. I love it. You know, one, one of the, one of the things you mentioned too, was you're talking about the mind, right? And, and in fact, mm -hmm. your company Valuepreneurship. Tell us a little bit about valuepreneurship. What is it? Uh, what do you guys do? So, valuepreneurship is uh, it is my method, which uh, is the evolutionary form of entrepreneurship, and it's the way that every every individual doing any kind of work, whether it's business or entrepreneurship, or or, or, a, or a corporate leader, or a political leader, or a, or a a welfare head or, or, or charitable person or anyone at all in public service, whatever we do, or sportsman or musician or whatever, it is the way that we engage with our, our world in terms of bringing the value to the world. So here, I mean, just in summary, here's the difference. An entrepreneur says, what product can I make? What service can I make? Who can I sell it to? How much money can I make? Um, which is fair enough. And it's brought us here and, and it's, done a, it's done a good job. Um, from here onwards, we need someone completely different. Uh, 
they're doing exactly the same work. And I'll give you examples if you if you want. But they're doing exactly the same work. They haven't changed their work. But their starting point is who's out there. And what's how is their world changing? And what kind of impact, value impact priorities is that throwing on them? Um, and then and only then sets about saying, let me develop a service, let me develop a product to be able to service that 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 value. Um, I mean, you know, I, I'll, I'll leave it up to you if you if you want uh, examples, but you know, there's examples pouring out of my <laughs> yeah. Well, out let's, of my let's take a step. Let's take a step back real quick for the for yeah. the listeners. What hmm. is like a value proposition, right? You, I think a lot of individuals and entrepreneurs probably hear about it. Like, what's a value proposition? How do you create value? In your sense, what what does that mean? What does that mean to an entrepreneur? The first thing I will say is to remove this word create. We don't create value. Um, the only value you could say we create is for, for um, shareholders. Um, but even that, I don't believe in using the word create. So, uh, and, and I'll be very specific what I mean. And, and the moment that our entrepreneur friends uh, who are in business or starting up or thinking of doing business, think in these terms, because who am I to create value of anyone. Value exists. I, again, I'll come back and I'll give you an example. Value exists. My role as a valuepreneur is to engage with that value, understand it genuinely, and be obsessed by it, and then and only then develop responses to service that value. So I don't create value, I serve value. So, um, you know, that, that's that's the way we go. Um, someone was saying to me, uh, I, I'll come back to more specific examples of, of you know, from, from my own work and, and stuff. But just to, to give you a little flavor of this, someone said to me, Sanjeev, does this apply to everyone? I said, yeah, absolutely, it applies to everyone. Um, and so they said, well, uh, what about an office cleaner? Uh, and I said, yeah, sure, absolutely, it applies to an office cleaner. So think about this, an office cleaner who's going into work with the thought of, Ah, same old office, same old dredge, same old broom, same old materials. You know, it's it's mundane, it's horrible, it's demeaning, it's a not a nice job. And it, that's the kind of thinking. Now, if you go into work with that thinking, are you going to be energized or are you going to be depleted? It's a very simple thing. And which is going to take you more towards success? But if the same cleaner, so that cleaner is doing a job, doing some work, but if the same to make money, but if the same cleaner is going in oblivious about what they're getting and in their mind is turning, what am I about today? Yeah, there's 100 people who work in that office. Um, so by doing the work I'm doing, I'm sanitizing that office. So I'm removing all viruses. So I'm protecting health. And and by, by cleaning it really brilliantly and giving a nice, crisp, fresh smelling atmosphere, uh, those guys, they're going to be able to work much better. So their productivity is going to go up is no longer a cleaner. He or she is the bringer of health and the bringer of, of, of productivity. Now, with the same, the, the work hasn't changed, Gabriel. Your business hasn't changed. But that obsession of coming out of the me zone into the you zone is fundamentally energizing. Now, you tell me, the next day, that which is the guy, which is the, the lady who's going to go in a lot more energized, a lot more interested. And if you were the office owner, who would you, who, you know, which is the of those the, the ones you would promote or give a bonus to, or might even say tomorrow that, hey, you want to start a cleaning business? I'll invest in you. So actually the valuepreneur is fundamentally more satisfied and actually becomes wealthier. We, we're missing this and we're making it about me. How much can I sell? How much money can I make? You know, and that desperation will bring down my resilience, my resolve, it'll generate fears. And this this is the fundamental um, aspect of every entrepreneur, which they need to let go and release. People say, don't, you know, be fearless. It's not, it's not that easy. It's not that simple. You can't, you can't say, right, today I'll be, I won't have fear. You can switch your mind from the me and the wanting zone, which generates fear, to the you and the giving zone, which is act, actually devoid of fear at, uh, at all. And, and there you go. <laughs> you know, that, that's a, such a solid point because, you know, one of the things I was constantly talking about, um, and so I work in the healthcare world, and one of the things I'm always talking about new employees is it takes all of you 
to care for these patients, right? You're kind of alluding to it, right? It takes the janitor being great at their job, takes food service, takes the PA, takes the MA, takes a, all these different you know, individuals to help care for these one patients to have a good outcome. And I try to convince folks to take pride in that, you know, take pride in these little opportunities. And I think what you're talking about, Sanjeev, too, is you don't have to be a, a business owner to be a value entrepreneur. Mm -mm -mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Entrepreneurship was uh, very trendily a few years ago. Um, out of the, it was born a word called intrapreneurship, right? Did, did, did you come across that? So it was basically saying that if you're working for, for a company, for a business, uh, uh, but behaving, so you're an employee, but behaving like an entrepreneur. So let's call that intrapreneurship. With valuepreneurship, we forget the idea of whether you're working for yourself or whether you're working for an organization. Ultimately, you are only working for yourself. Whoever you are, if you're a project manager, you know, in Johnson & Johnson, you're actually working for yourself. Because the, the, the whole issue is that as a project manager, how far is your mind going that this project, I'm working in Johnson & Johnson, is going to, to help to release uh, new stents to be able to service uh, my uh, the end patient uh, and, and be able to not see the patient uh, you know, after uh, just six months because they're coming back for reintervention, but after six years because they're healthy and living life. So it's, it's, you're, you're a valuepreneur. Uh, you know, and, and valuepreneurs are happier and, and they, yes, yes. And they do become wealthier. There's no question about it. Yeah. And let me, let me give the listeners at home a great example. So I'm, I'm sitting on the board of directors currently for the American Association of Physician Liaisons. I'm the president of the board. One thing I'm constantly talking to our board about is how do we create value to enlist more national members? One, which also creates a stronger brand awareness. Two, which also creates more value back to the sponsors that attend our conferences for these members, right? And it's all about creating value or sometimes perceived value as well. Talk about the difference between value, like, creating value and then creating the perception of value. Okay, super, brilliant. Did you say it was the Association of Physicians? Correct. Ah, I love working with physicians. So let me give you, it, so your question is, what's the difference between creating value and and the building the perception of value? Correct. Okay, uh, it's just sequential, first of all. Uh, let, let me go straight to the point and then I'll come back and give you an example. Go straight to the point. Look, um, think about this. If I have something of value for you, something of great value to, for you, which really uh, affects you or uh, helps you with your priorities or shapes your life in some way or improves your work or delivers something of value to you. Let's say that I have something which is absolutely positioned and, and sorry, absolutely the perfect response to your value, um, but you don't find out about it. Who am I doing a disservice to? I'm first of all doing a disservice. So nothing wrong with marketing and building perception. On the contrary, it's the most noble act. And people say, oh, marketing and sales is, is, is a dirty. Well, if you do it with a dirty mind that, you know, how much can I grab and how much money can I get and, and, and stuff like that, then, then it's a dirty act. You know, a, a surgeon who's using a scalpel to take out a, a, a kidney to replace it with a good one, and a, and, the, and a surgeon who's using a scalpel to take out a kidney to sell it, it, don't blame surgery. Don't blame the scalpel. The scalpel is great. It's the intention behind it. So if your intention is to deliver value, and if you then don't build the perception behind it and a brand behind it for the world to know, then you are doing it not only, then you're first of all doing a disservice to your market, to your customers, because you have something which you are not showing them and they're not, the, it's a beautiful word perception actually. I, lo I love the word perception because, you know, in the classic four P's of marketing, people talk about the P of promotion. And, and I, I say, don't call it promotion. It is perception. Perception of what? So let's think about this, perception of what? It is the perception that my response through my product, my service is genuinely serving the value that I've understood. And again, I'll remove the word create and use the word serve value. 
I don't create value. I serve value. To serve value, I have to understand it. So, so therein lies this this amazing di- di- difference. Um, I was talking about physicians. I was coaching and building perception and so on. I was I was coaching a very senior cardiologist, interventional cardiologist. Um, uh, I was asked by Johnson and Johnson to do this for one of the the, the top cardiologists. I won't name the the person in Paris because he was going to present a paper uh, in in a huge conference. So you talk about conferences and 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 how to build the perception. And when and so they invited me to come and and help him and coach him to be able to make this presentation. I went to Paris, and there it was. We were practicing this thing. You've got a you've got an auditorium of of four and a half thousand people, a gigantic screen behind him, and a an lectern and a, and the 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 laptop. And here it goes. That dear colleagues, thank you for coming to my presentation. I'm going to be talking about drug eluting stents as opposed to normal stents because these. Uh, uh, bring this and and we studied 1500 patients and we did this and we did that and here was the research protocol and you know it literally was yawn uh, provoking and i said you know professor um making a scientific presentation is no joke and he said that you're you're absolutely right so uh, it is no joke uh, i hope no french people will get offended by what i'm saying but he was a lovely lovely gentleman he said it is no joke how do you mean i said because in a joke you keep the punchline to the end and that's why this is not a joke so build the perception that people and then you see the engagement and here is cut a long story short he invited me the following week to PCR. It's a big per- cardiology conference at Porte Maillot in, in Paris. And, and, I, and I was sitting in the front row and the presentation, he forgot the laptop and, the, and the, the, the lectern and the screen and everything. He walked up to the stage and this was no trick. It had, we had inculcated that feeling of you are an instrument of value. You started by saying, who are you? And I said, I'm an instrument of value. He came up to the edge of the stage and there were four and a half thousand physicians sitting in that in that uh, in that hall, and he just looked at them and said, "Dear colleagues, I want you to imagine you've come into your cath lab, and there you have a patient uh, with a complicated lesion at the bifurcation point of the aorta and the complication of diabetes. What goes through your mind? You don't want to see the patient uh, after six months because they're coming back for reintervention." You want to at least wait six years and they're having a comfortable life, that the cost of your intervention comes down by 20% and that you can handle two more patients in the day and that you can significantly increase the safety of the patient. And there was a hush in the room, absolutely cutting engagement. And, And he zipped it. And someone in the front row said, Professor, we're with you. Can you show us how? And then he took pleasure in, in showing the slides and so on. So it's this is not a trick of hooking anyone. I'm talking about a genuine obsession of serving that value. And when you've and but to serve that value, you have to understand the value. To understand that value, you have to lose the sense of self. You have to go into the you sphere and understand it from there. Then you build your responses through your products and services to perfectly serve that. By the way, before you even build your products and services, before you understand value, you need to understand whose value. So you know, you, you've you got to, to be clear of your market. I mean, Steve uh, Jobs was absolutely clear. Uh, he, he decided to kick the biggest volume market segment available to him, which was corporations. He had that kind of courage to focus. Strategy is about, as business is about, as much about saying what I should do as it is about saying what I shouldn't do. And and it became the richest company in the world. I'm not saying kick uh, high volume markets. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying make a decision in which markets and on whose value your responses, your talents, your skill, your capability, your knowledge, your product, your service can make the biggest depth of impact. Choose those markets then build your responses, then go out and with pride be able to say, dear customer, we know you have this value. Here's how to serve it. Who? It's actually impossible to fail and not do amazingly well in business. It's impossible. Yeah. And, you know, I think, Sanjeev, what you really highlighted, and I hope the folks are understanding this, is when you're creating that, when you're talking about value, like you gave the example about the provider in the, in doing a lecture, 
The reason those providers became so engaged is because he used a case study that was relatable to them. Again, going yeah. back to Sanjeev was talking about understanding the user's issue and what the user perceives as value and what's valuable to them and then targeting that. You know, I, I talk about this often. I do a lot of uh, national presentations and, and do a lot of, you know, keynote speaking. And the first thing I try to constantly do is how do I, one, relate to the audience, right? Humanize myself, right? So they can know like, okay, I'm a human. And then I start pulling out the heartstrings. And then I'm gonna give you the data, right? Because yeah. there's nothing more in like when you have the audience and you you just know, right? You just know yeah. you have the audience, you have their full attention. But now you need to actually bring them something of value at the end. They can't leave Completely. it like you can't just build it up and then just flat, right? You at the end, absolutely. And, and at the end, and 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 very much the beginning. Uh, that's that's the start of the journey. Um, because it, there's only one way ultimately you'll engage, uh, and 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 you're alluding to this very very beautifully, Gabriel. That there's only one way you will engage your audience, and that is by hitting them, by uh, what by touching their value, and not not by speaking about yourself, because then people will see you. And and I'm not. And again, I I repeat. Uh, folks, for for all entrepreneurs, budding entrepreneurs, uh, and and people who listen to to Gabriel's, and I've listened to some of the the podcasts you've done, Gabriel. I think you're doing absolutely stellar work and helping so many people. And, and my 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 point to you is, is is this: lose yourself, forget yourself. Uh, this might sound harsh. You know, there there are two spheres in life. Think about this: there's the me sphere and the you sphere. Right? What's turning in the me sphere? Me, my product, my business, my bank, my my bank account, my uh, my future, my growth, my success, my competitors, my my customers, um, uh, my my sales, my profits, my revenue, my family, my growth. All this is turning in my in my in the me sphere. What's turning in the you sphere, in the customer sphere? Exactly the same things in reverse. Me, my priorities, my customers, <laughs> my sales, my family, my growth, my success. The, it's a simple question. Which sphere do you need to obsessively sit in? Me or the you? You know, it's, it's, and to that extent, you actually have to bigger, put a big red cross on the me sphere and leave yourself out of this equation and, and sit in there as royally. And, and someone said to me, yeah, but Sanjeev, what about me? And what about my success? If you're telling me to cross out the, the, the me sphere, what about, what about me? And what about my value? Ah, oh, here's a question. And reflect on this, you know, here's the question. Who will you buy from? Someone who's obsessed with you, your value, and, and looking at you and understanding you genuinely, you know, or, or the person who's trying to, to, to sell you a contract and win your business right? It's a no-brainer. And everyone gives the same answer. It's, it's the first guy. And who will you argue more on prices with? The second guy, which is the entrepreneur. So who's going to get wealthier? In any, so if the valuepreneur is actually going to, you're going to buy from, they're going to sell more and at better prices. And, 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 and so who's going to become wealthier in any case? It's, it's a no, no-brainer. It, integrity makes you wealthy. Yep. And I think, I think for the folks listening, if you've gone back and listened to a lot of these entrepreneurs, the successful entrepreneurs that I've interviewed on this show, they will con constantly talk to you about creating value for the customers. Uh, I think, you know, to your point, Sanjeev, you, especially in the healthcare world where one, you know, we can come out with these very niche, you know, products and very, you know, it helps like one in every 20,000 or 40,000 patients. Well, who's that truly bring, like, that's not very valuable. Um, you know, uh, it's like if you're cleaning something that helping every one of four patients, now that's valuable, right? Yeah. Not to say that those one in 40,000 patients are important, but I'm saying we need to try to find out how we can do the one in four, right? Yeah. Focus your time on that. Now, what would you say are some of the common mistakes entrepreneurs have when trying to create a brand around value? Um, the, the fundamental mistake is that they, uh, and, and if I ask, and I, I often do when I'm teaching, coaching uh, entrepreneurs uh, or, or corporate people, and I say, what is a brand? And what does it do? 
And you can imagine the list that comes in. If I ask you, uh, you know, uh, everyone uh, listening to this right now, here's the list and correct me if I'm wrong. The list would be a brand. Ah, yes, a brand identifies me. Uh, it shows who I am. It, it projects me and my products and uh, it gets me known and it, ide- and it identifies me. It's a logo. It's an asset. You know, and it uh, it it's it's what I use to generate uh, it generates income for me and profits for me. Now, who am I talking about? Which sphere am I in? <laughs> I'm back in the me sphere. And do you know how I spell sphere? But how, the correct spelling of sphere is S P H E R E, right? And I need to go into the you sphere, and that's the same with the brand. And but the mistake I make is I stay in the me S F E A R. Sphere. I hope it works for me. I hope they like me. I hope my brand goes forward. I hope that that I'm better than competitors. I hope they realize that that I'm 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 do- the moment you're in the I hope you you you've gone and this is the fundamental mistake. So I make the brand. I I'm I think the brand is about me. Now the question, if I ask you the question, name me a successful brand, and what makes you associate with it. And whether you know you say Tesla or Apple or, or or your local coffee shop, you know down and you might say, well, my coffee shop is is a great brand. Yeah, great, cool. Uh, you know uh, Joe's Cafe down the road. It's it's a great brand. So why is it a great brand? Yeah, because he's really understood that every morning when I'm on my way to work, I'm so pressed for time, uh, and uh, so so he set up a he sent me an app and and I give a pre order and. Uh, and he can actually track when I'm, uh, you know, 200 yards away and and my coffee is made and ready and it's already paid for from an app. So it's saving me time. It's getting me to work on time and enjoying my coffee. I don't have to. So suddenly the whole thing has has translated into, into value. And that's a good brand. So now the brand is not about you anymore. I mean, uh, it's not about me, the owner of the brand. It is always about what it is delivering. Is it speed? Is it certainty? Is it availability? Uh, is it surety? Is it creativity? Is it ident- identifying me as the customer uh, as, as, uh, as part of a, a, a group or something? So the moment you go into the me zone, you'll find successful brands. The moment you sit in the, uh, sorry, the, 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 the you zone, you'll find successful brands. The moment you sit in the me zone, those are the brands that that tend to go and it's very difficult to even name those. I mean, I, I know many. Nokia, BlackBerry, right? Uh, Kodak, gigantic brands while they were there. Blockbusters, but they, I use Blockbuster often. <laughs> Blockbuster's a great example. <laughs> but they didn't progress with the changing values of the markets that they had chosen to work with. And, and it became about me. You know, I do... Uh, film and film is what everyone needs. Will always re- the, the, and it and and the and the world was changing. So this is the fundamental mistake. Actually, in everything I'm saying, Gabriel, it always comes back to the same same simple issue: obsess with not only the essential value of your. Cu- and I'll tell you what I mean by that: essential value of your customers. But the business value and the personal value, and if you if you think about it, essential value is the smallest, business value is bigger, and personal value is even bigger. So let's go back to the example I I just made up of the of the cafe, um, not made up actually. That the, the, there is a person who I'm coaching who's um, as a side business starting a cafe, and we're thinking about all these things. Um, the essential value is getting a coffee. <laughs> You know, getting a, a coffee, cafe, latte with a caramel shot with this, blah, 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 blah. You know, the, the way that uh, that you guys, uh, especially in America, have an amazing way. I'm so impressed by ordering coffee. You know, I just say, give me a double. I just say, give me a double macchiato. I'm done, man. <laughs> extra, extra hot. No, I started to say extra hot. Um, so, but that is the essential value, the coffee. My business value, which is bigger than that, is that I can get to my work on time. My personal value could be anything. It, it, it might be that, that I feel 
I feel so respected. I feel that I can have a chat with with the, the guy who's making the coffee in the morning or that by getting to work on time, I can get my presentation done and I'll be seen much better by my boss that day. So it, it's that level of obsession of understanding your market and then and only then creating innovative creative responses do you, do you want me to just mention something about innovations in, which is linked to this? I yes, don't know if you... Means. You know, there are three I's. There's uh, innovation, invention, and inconvenience. All right? In fact, three ins. Um, in, 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 most of what we do are, in, are inventions. They're very good inventions. The Concorde was an excellent invention. Excellent invention. I don't call it an innovation. Why? If it was an innovation, we would have had Mark II and Mark III flying around today. It was 18 years ago. It wasn't just because of the crash. It's because that this was an absolutely amazing piece of engineering, supersonic airliner, get you to from London to New York in three hours instead of six and a half. Wow, man. You know, it, it's it, the wow factor was there. It looked absolutely stunning. It was beautiful. There seemed to be nothing wrong with the product whatsoever. Why, is, why don't we have an, another one flying around today? Why? It's 18 years. And that's because there was no real value that it was serving in the marketplace, not a not a, a viable value that it was able to serve in the marketplace. You know, there were it, there wasn't a strong enough market to carry a uh, hundred passengers royally but uncomfortably, and cut the time between London and New York by 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 three hours. Um, it just was. That's why it was. So it was. So that's an invention because it was about. Aerospatial and British Aerospace and, and Deutsche Aerospace saying, guys, let's do a supersonic airliner. And this is my message to all entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs typically are, are geniuses, brilliant people who are passionate about what they do. And I'm saying there's a trap. Therein lies the trap. Become passionate about what it does for anyone. And then if it's, if it's impacting that value, fine, go ahead with it. If not, actually do something else. Doesn't matter how good you are at it, you know? So that is invention. Innovations come from obsessively understanding the market. Now, when you start from the market, like I gave you the ex example of the coffee um, uh, shop or, or tons and tons of examples, um, that when, when, you, when you start from the market, you will find that you your creative juices will flow. Your innovation will flow much, much more because you're, you're actually solving someone's problem. Then when you design the product, I'm not saying anything new, Gabriel. I am not saying anything new. What I am saying and why I'm saying it is what is completely new about it is that in my humble experience, and I'm saying this with incredible modesty, gratitude, um, for, for having had the good fortune of having thousands of people and hundreds of organizations from small, small coffee shops to, to Johnson & Johnson um, that, that I've had the, the good fortune to work with, um, that what's new about what I'm saying is that everyone says the right thing, everyone has the right idea, but when it comes down to doing it, it's revert to type. We run back to focus on what we do. We start inventing. We start responding before understanding. And so, I mean, and my methods and so on, I'm sorry, you know, it's, 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 it's in here. It, it's 550 pages of my love poured into this thing to give step-by-step -step calculations. We calculate, it's taken me 110 pages to actually define what is value in very practical terms and calculate it. So when you start from there, it's a cliche, but the world actually is your oyster. And that's what uh, Steve Jobs did. He didn't, Steve Jobs never made product. Nope, correct. Same as Nike. Nike doesn't make a product. And for, for folks, uh, Sanjeev is actually holding up as a book. I'll have this book uh, available for you on the newsletter as well. So to make sure that you have that. Now, you know, you mentioned Steve Jobs. You know, folks, I want to give you a great example that kind of encompasses this entire conversation, I think very, very well. And I know we've been using Apple pretty consistently, so I'm just going to stay with this. Steve Jobs originally made the supercomputer, right? 
when he made this supercomputer, it can do everything, but he made it before the time that it was, there was no value in making more. So he only made one, right? This is before the Mac came out and all these other things. And then he eventually found out, okay, what do people find of value? Okay. A great example is the iPod. When the iPod came out, there's a phenomenal picture of an iPod sitting there standing up with two headphones around it. And the marketing campaign was very simple. A thousand songs in your pocket. That's it. Yep. That's all it said. Didn't talk about the functionalities. It didn't talk about the aesthetics. It simply said, here's the value I have for you. This little thing can put a thousand songs in your pocket. That's it. That's all it did. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and that again goes back to that marketing and the branding piece of the creating value. Right. And also understanding the users. Steve Jobs understood, hey, users were walking around with these either CDs, right? Remember the old CD? I might be dating myself here, but Walkmans as well. Back in, we had Walkmans, right? Steve Jobs understood that the end user truly valued music and they valued their time of music. How, how can I make it easier and simpler for them to access those music, but even more of them? Beautiful, beautifully put. Beautifully. The iPod, the iPad, the iMac, the i this and the i that. These are not, these were never products. They were perfect responses, like you just put uh, so eloquently uh, on this, uh, Gabriel, that they were just responses to value. His obsession was with value. It's hardly surprising. And he had the courage to kick the biggest volume market available to him. And, uh, you know, because it, that was his thinking. And it's hardly surprising it became the first trillion, the first $2 trillion uh, company in the world and so on. But, but let me give you an entrepreneurial example. I was I was on the board of a um, I was non-executive director of this one of the biggest. Uh, it's a big wine supplier here in the UK, and their major customers were um, the big supermarkets. So you have the, the 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 Tesco's and even the Costco's and so on. Tesco, Sainsbury's, Costco's, and and these kind of giant supermarkets, and. And I said to them one day, sitting in a in, in a board meeting, and we were, I was doing an executive um, uh, for the for, for their their kind of team. We were we were working on strategy and repositioning the strategy. And I said, guys, uh, they were struggling because they were they were the margins were very squeezed in retail. Margins are extremely squeezed. And and I said, guys, what would it take for a customer to move from a seven pound bottle? Uh, you know, what, what, an eight dollar bottle. Not, and these days, the exchange rate is pretty low. <laughs> to a to an eleven dollar bottle. From an eight dollar bottle to an eleven dollar bottle, and they're really scratching their heads, and they're saying, "You know what? Not that much." Now, can you imagine moving from eight dollars to eleven dollars? What is it going to do to your margins? It's absolutely going to revolutionize your your results. And if they're saying it won't take much, then I said, what would it take? And what's the central problem here? And they said, well, the problem is that the customer, if they knew what was inside the bottle, then, they would, then they'd be happy to move. So they're only buying on price. So, you know, if, if, you've, if you've got your, your, your chums coming for a football match, you, you look a little bit lower down the, the, the shelves. Uh, and if your in-laws are coming and you want to impress them, then then you look higher up the shelves. And, and that's how it's bought because people don't know. To cut a long story short, we created a strategy on this one single comment which of value, which was if they knew what was in the bottle. That was it. We took that simple thing and we created a whole business called Wine in Tube. So now you can imagine that uh, a beautiful pack, like uh, with beautiful uh, test tubes. I mean, not not like you get in chemistry labs, but but very nice ones. Uh, f- a pack of five that come through your letterbox because you subscribe to that, and and it's got five wines in there, and you you click on the link, uh, and and it's there, and someone is telling you, hey, try number one. Now, can you feel these notes and can you feel the the berries in there? And this one will go with cheese beautifully, and that one goes. And, and, and then you order a case or two of whichever one you like. It, so it completely revolutionized that business because from doing wine and struggling on margins because a Costco just puts it on the shelf, that's it. And you can only go on the label and price, nothing else. To if, uh, Because the vast majority, to suddenly being able to engage with it and bring value 
So now people are buying this for sports uh, uh, evenings and and that one for for fancy dinners, uh, and yeah. the business has gone crazy. Yeah, it's very very true. It's very true, and I think, you know, folks, I, I hope that you know this conversation. One thing it's truly bringing to you, is, no pun intended, but I hope it did bring a lot of value because it's brought a lot of value to me, and it's kind of sparking the. I feel like now. You know, I'm constantly talking about value. Now I feel like I'm finally on the right train, you know, based on our conversation. I'm like, you know what? I think I'm going down the right path. Now, Sanjeev, if folks at home that are listening, they want to connect with you. Maybe they want, you know, you mentioned you do some professional coaching. Maybe they want to connect with you and get some mentorship. How can they connect with you? What is your website? How can they find you on the internet? Oh, cool. All right. That's uh, th- uh, Thanks for asking. It's uh, the, the website is valuepreneurship.com. It's as simple as that, valuepreneurship.com. Uh, and uh, at the bottom of the front page are contacts, my 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 PA, my EA, it's all there. Or, or, or connect with me on um, on LinkedIn. Just look up Sanjeev Lumba, uh, Valuepreneurship. You'll find me. Yeah. And, and folks, again, you know, shameless plug for the newsletter. You can subscribe to the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter at theshadesv.com. I will have Sanjeev's information as well, he, you know, Sanjeev, you mentioned you actually showed it briefly. Can you give the audience at home, uh, since they're probably not going to be able to see what the book title is, uh, and if they're interested in purchasing it, where they can find it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's uh, it's called the Ninth Gear. The Ninth Gear. Um, uh, the subtitle is Valuepreneurship, of course, but it's called the Ninth Gear, and it's it is it's uh, it's the philosophy of value, but it's much more than that. We could say actually a manual for every startup, for every entrepreneur, it'll step-by-step give you how to develop the strategy with this valuepreneurship uh, in mind, how to calculate value, and then how to manage people, how to manage relationships, how to sell your ideas. It's got it's got all of this stuff. And also a very, very important topic, uh, Gabriel, in, in section three is all about the mind. Because uh, you can have all the technique or value of strategy and, and a business plan and all this kind of stuff. But if your mind is in, in fear and it's in, and we talk about you sphere, me sphere and all these kind of things in, in a lot of depth over there. So, uh, yeah, by, by all means, you're, you're most welcome to go and look it up. Perfect. And again, <laughs> and I it's, will, on, it's on Amazon and it's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and wherever you want to see it. Yeah. Perfect. And I'll, I'll make sure again, this information is in fact on the newsletter. So again, folks, uh, make sure you go ahead and subscribe at the shades of e.com. You can also follow us on the social sites. I'll make sure I'll have Sunji's information um, on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and then uh, we'll probably do a little promo on the Twitter or the TikTok as well. So please follow me at the shades of E on that. Sanjeev, any last words you have for the listeners? But, uh, it, my, uh, the only uh, advice I would, I would say is that as entrepreneurs, uh, we all often make ourselves vulnerable. We, we are often um, in, in, a, in a zone of will it happen, will it not happen? Will I be able to, to, to get my products out there? Will I not be able to get? And, and that is demoralizing. And very often that in itself is the cause of, of less success. Folks, just be obsessively um, fascinated. So, I mean, obsess with the, the end value. Understand it. Talk to your customers, but calculate it. It's all in section one of the book, by the, uh, by the way, of how to do this. You know, so obsess with them. Come out of the the you, cut the expectations. And when you're delivering value, when you're giving a gift, you're never in fear. For, fear. Always when you want something, you are in fear. So when you want that sale and when you want it to happen, this depletes your your energy like we talked about the the the, the cleaner. And and you'll be hugely successful. If there's any way that I can I can help you in any way or your business, then um, as Gabriel said, I'm there for you. Sanjeev Lumba, thank you so much for your time. Value Entrepreneurship, again, valueentrepreneurship.com. This information will be on the website as well as the newsletter. Sanjeev, thank you so much for taking your time. I've found a lot of value in this conversation, no pun intended. 
Um, I thought it was great. You had some phenomenal examples. I'm really excited uh, to kind of maybe uh, grab this book and, and kind of dive into it myself. So those folks listening at home, again, please uh, subscribe to the Shades of E, the podcast on Apple or Spotify and all where you can find your podcast locations. You can also subscribe to the newsletter at the shades of E.com. Other than that, thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.